Okay, so we're going to start with Rainier de Graaf. Uh, somebody was talking about bravado, and uh, I, I think it's an interesting notion. Uh, I mean, I think there was a lot of bravado in Patrick's uh, talk, and of course, a lot of ensuing bravado, uh, which I'm not sure what it was about. Uh, but let's look at a different kind of bravado. Uh, this is a statement. I'm not going to interrogate the audience like, do you know what this is? <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. It saves a lot of time. Um, where is he? All right, okay. Um, this is a statement at a real estate fair uh, in Dubai. And the city that they're talking about is this city. Projected with a lot of bravado, it's the city that is emerging in the desert, uh, outside the West, outside any of our educational ethics. It's a city that there is emerging, and this is the city that they're talking about. God knows who the architects of these buildings are. There might be women architects in this lineup of bravado, you know, but nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows who they are, and they produce. They produce so many square meters that you, would, you know, if you add all of Eisenman's houses together, it's peanuts. If you add our entire oeuvre together, if you add up CCTV with Shenzhen, with, even with all our unbuilt work, it's nothing compared to what is being built here, constructed. And this is reality. And I'm also not sure about proportional systems. I'm even not sure about parametrics. I think it is a weird historic cocktail where it's a bit of everything. And that is ultimately history. It's, it's a weird remnant of leftovers. What some people present is with a certain amount of conviction in their time and then is progressively bastardized by everybody who does it later. And I ask a serious question because this is a lineup of a different type of architects. Uh, uh, they're not all Pritzker Prize winners, but I mean, there's a fair amount amongst them in as much uh, as they're not Pritzker Prize winners. There may be Pritzker Prize winners very surely, but this is the kind of lineup of stars, and I'm not sure whether I could call them heroes, uh, but I think given the limited difference between this and this, let's just call them stars for the moment. I'll get to heroes uh, in a minute. And, you know, this is us, somewhere right there in the middle. And the interesting thing is this is what we call our most iconic building, an iconic building for the China state television and standing out, and they got the brand in, in the middle of Beijing. But if you put it in the skyline, you have to put a red box around it. And you probably even have to put a red box around some of Patrick's buildings, which is saying something. Uh, you don't notice it anymore. There is a kind of an ex cumulative extravagance that, that well, of the sum total which is, it, they cancel each other out. I mean, there's so much violence to the eye that the eye becomes insensitive in the end. And uh, Patrick also in his talk presented the financial crisis as a momentary halt of the inevitable evolution of man towards parametricism. Um, I, in a way, we have a different take, and in a way, I think the crisis was precisely the pause uh, that I was talking about uh, in the context uh, of that lecture. And we were active in that context when this was, was, all of this was happening, and made a kind of very interesting uh, discovery, which is a very strangely reactionary discovery, uh, even in that context, that in the context of cumulative extravagance, uh, the boring, uh, acquires uh, the, the status of the sublime. So this was a building, very large building uh, we did, never got built, unfortunately. But anyway, it means that what do you do here? Do you build more or do you do something like that? I mean, something that is simply length times height times width, even uh, there is a proportional system uh, in here, uh, actually. Uh, it, it sort of weirdly stands out and it, it's kind of it's become weirdly full circle, is that in a sense that a lot of aspects of modernism that people complained about and, and complained about all over the world, they made everything the same, uh, the, the whole East Block is, is essentially, you know, architects disappeared, 
for mass prefabricated housing. It is a monotonous uh, thing. But this is familiar in a very different way, is that that same illness kind of becomes a cure in the context of, of another illness. And it, it is a very thing that we don't really know uh, what to make of it. Anyway, at the time we made it, we were sort of very happy, uh, branded it, etc., cetera, and, and then it never got built, and then uh, I, I, I kind of wonder. Uh, and and obvious, obviously, very often you don't know what conclusions to draw. Uh, from these things. We're very proud of the design, it didn't get built, so you can also say it's a failure, it's a lost competition, uh, etc. But then recently I came across this uh, somewhere else uh, and found out that it actually did get built. Uh, I do not know the author. This is the Holiday Inn in uh, Beirut. It has bullet holes uh, to the front, friendly bullet holes. I mean, I don't know, I will again not ask. Uh, I'll quiz the audience. Uh, it was a hotel in Beirut that, you know, was the prime scene of the civil war. And every room was fought over. This is a Palestinian uh, freedom fighter uh, or, or fighter, participator in the war in front of a poster of Nasser. And that was 30 years ago, more. And today the building stands in Beirut. And Beirut develops. I mean, Beirut is hot all the property market, all the imars, all the kind of Middle Eastern property, it's already there. They all move in there and they make modern architecture. There have been numerous plans to bring this building back to life. They've all failed because the finances don't add up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and across the street, this is being uh, built. It doesn't matter, this is somebody else, a Pritzker Prize winner. doesn't matter who they are. Um, heroes of modern architecture, and, and there's this strange, seen in the city, you know, of empty space that cannot be filled, evidently, and another building of a similar size going up right across it. It looks different and it looks somewhat similar. It's modern architecture and it's modern architecture. It's the 20th century, it's the 21st century, and, and in a very strange way, there is a stylistic continuation of modern architecture, practiced quite aggressively uh, by very well, uh, well-known architects, lesser well-known architects. Um, of course, uh, the building is uh, you know, celebrated, but at the same time also vilified. I mean, a lot of our efforts, and that's the tragicness of stardom, is both celebrated and vilified. And I think it is very important. The reason to look at context is, is to look at the criticism that, that, that comes around. You know, drives up, it's an aid in driving up Beirut's uh, uh, property prices. It's part of a global movement of this type of building happens there. Uh, there's another architect or something similar happens all over the place, all over the place. Respectable, and this is now the generic, uh, if you would do a similar uh, effort uh, that Jeffrey did with Guggenheim on residential projects, this is what you, uh, what you find. In a way, a kind of international style, a kind of collective style, and a style that is increasingly running into trouble. This is the Chinese uh, leader, in a way, claiming his country uh, back. Uh, and when he does it, he likes to talk about architecture. I don't know why architects are always in the forefront of everybody's irritations, but somehow we are. Um, uh, architecture should be like sunshine from the blue sky and the breeze in spring that will inspire minds, uh, warm hearts. Uh, it's wonderful prose cultivate taste and clean up undesirable work styles. It's a very interesting that there's one communist leader echoing another one, 1954, Khrushchev's famous speech against the wastefulness of, uh, of Stalinist architecture. But there is an increasing question that I don't think there is any such thing as 21st century architecture yet. And I simply don't have the answer. This is a kind of uh, series of things. Golosov uh, Workers Club, in Moscow, uh, 1928, uh, uh, Hadith's thing in Cincinnati, 21st century, I think, 2003, uh, Elishitsky, uh, some fashionable Dutch architect of the moment, uh, Richard Meyer, and Richard Meyer, uh, House 20 and House 6, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, uh, you know, not to spare ourselves, uh, 
the marble of the Barcelona Pavilion and the same marble in a bus stop in Groningen in one of our earlier bits of work. 1914, uh, the year when World War I began, uh, this was the prototype, and in a way the summary of the invention of what reinforced concrete allowed, a separation between load bearing and separating structures and the kind of the start of the Plan Libre and of Corbusier's five rules. That is still there. This is an unfinished structure in, in uh, Greece uh, that is not finished deliberately uh, for tax reasons and clearly uh, the economic state of the Greek uh, economy. But in very many ways, for me, it's a very significant image, you know, because that invention where is it? has become a generic condition. It exists. It exists in every form, in almost every building. That is the same. The image is almost one-on-one -on -one the same, but ne nevertheless, there is a market enormous uh, difference. The same repertoire of economy of means, uh, rational production, all of those things that at one point served, was meant to serve the greater good. Uh, I mean, we build efficiently, we, we could build quickly, so we could build for as many possible people uh, as cheaply as possible and to make the blessings of modernization available to a large number of people. That repertoire today serves an entirely different purpose. It largely serves the fact that buildings are built efficiently and built cheaply doesn't mean they're sold cheaply. In fact, they couldn't be farther apart. And the same repertoire uh, that served one ideology serves another one in the 21st century where it becomes completely complicit in a kind of profit maximization and the financial mechanisms that now determine uh, architecture. Uh, everybody that does a modern building is supposedly a progressively, relatively enlightened, uh, well-thinking individual. Uh, there's a lot of pride uh, about it, but at the same time there is a complicitness, an unwitting complicitness in the fact that that whole instrumentarium is abused uh, for entirely different purposes. So. Uh, thanks for stealing my uh, thunder, but I'll, I'll briefly bore you to death with an economist. Um, there is an interesting coincidence, and I don't even know if it's more than a coincidence, but even if it is a coincidence, it's a striking coincidence. A uh, French economist, uh, in a way, who's analyzed uh, the behavior of capital uh, over a very, very long period of time, compared the return on labor vis-a-vis -vis the return of capital, and argues that as soon as you make more money from money than you do from working, inequality inevitably is on the increase. So he analyzed the two curves, very long period uh, in time, and in his economic thinking, uh, the 20th century is at least an economic anomaly, the result of two opposing systems uh, that kept each other in check and that exercised apparently enough counterforce on the natural tendencies of capital to inverse that relationship. Uh, and now if you look at that and if you zoom on that and you analyze the period more precisely, what you find is that in, in any way many of the utopian visions, particularly the utopian visions of modern architecture, produce roughly conform uh, to that same period, the period that social mobility was possible and therefore there was social mobility that could be cast in stone. Uh, then, uh, uh, and there's a very thing, that, that gap begins to close that more or less coincides with the demolition of pruitt Igo. I think, I'm sure this is 100% a coincidence, but in the course of any narration, it's a coincidence that is simply too beautiful not to tell. So after pruitt Igo, there is a distinct, uh, there is skepticism, uh, Patrick referred to it, about the powers of modern architecture beyond architecture itself. The mood becomes pensive, sorry, the mood becomes pensive, reading books, uh, but they've even stopped doing, uh, doing that. If you zoom out again, therefore you see that the utopianism in the context of which many of us, and even guys like me, were educated, and the whole notion of modern architecture as an endpoint of evolution may in fact be nothing more than a short anomaly, as may be uh, our, our value. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Um, the period more precisely, 1940s to 1989, from uh, Sarajevo, uh, the killing of Franz Ferdinand, to the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall. It's very interesting that the two uh, most prominent uh, 
writings of those years. Uh, the start of that period is the Futurist Manifesto, and the end of that period is a vision of Britain by Prince Charles. Uh, I think that is a very, very telling uh, thing in a way, because take that one step further. 1914, the bloody uniform of Kaiser Franz Ferdinand to the decorated uniform of a, a British a royal. And it gets to a point that you can actually wonder if that whole period really meant anything, if it ever uh, existed, if the same mechanisms seem to determine uh, our, our fate. So, boom. That's, in a way, the natural tendency of an uh, unconditional uh, surrender to capital. Piketty uh, argues that, you know, if the 20th century eradicated the notion of hereditary wealth, we're well on the way of reinstating it in the 21st century with all kinds of repercussions. Anyway. Um, so, two men, seeming uh, addition. Uh, both men had a passion for hunting. Uh, both men had a passion for architecture. Uh, the Belvedere in Vienna and, and Buckingham Palace, you know, in a, in a, in a continuous embrace of things. Uh, so we had, I mean, it, it begs the question, I mean, if Utopia had a beginning and it has an end, uh, you know, you wonder what's before it, you wonder what is uh, after it. And I basically don't know, uh, but I think about it. Um, this was uh, the book in 1991, when the Bush, uh, two years after the Berlin Wall had collapsed, and this was its general uh, assumption. What we may be witnessing is not just the end uh, of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such, that is the end of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. So before 19... Uh, 91, we had the coexistence of these systems, and it was presumed that in a way after 1991, uh, the world would become one in its collective embrace of Western liberal democracy, and that that would of course create a level economic playing field uh, in, in which, in all fairness, practice like ours has of course also operated. Uh, the assumption uh, of similar economic and political conditions as a minimum conditions to be globally operative. The moment we currently find ourselves is that it's increasingly clear that that is never gonna happen. This is our admittedly simplistic representation of the global political situation of the present. Let me uh, explain it. There is democracy, it's blue, so it's in a way a hereditary situation. From the, there you have election, there is dictatorship, there you don't have election, and then there is an increasingly successful political category where you have elections, but you know the outcome in advance. Uh, the, the Russians call it managed uh, democracy, and it's very serious because it has the potential, on the one hand, to erode established democracies, but it also gives dictatorships the potential to posture as democracy. So it's, it's, it's in a way a corrosive effect on either side. And we, talk, we spoke about stars and we spoke about heroes, so let's call them stars. Let's see, this is a cumulative uh, things of quotes uh, uh, there. We're in a, this is Norman Foster, uh, when he's commenting or complaining rather about how slow, incredibly slow it is to build anything uh, in the West. He's talking about uh, the terminal at Heathrow. We're in a state of denial. While they, he means the Chinese, are making decisions in the spirit of the Victorians, they have the courage to try it. Uh, and he's not the only one. I mean, Foster builds a lot, uh, but he's not the only one. What attracts me about China is that there is still a state. There is something that can take initiative on a scale and of a nature that almost nobody that we know of today could ever afford or contemplate. I have no idea who he is. Um, the, more se sorry, uh, the more centralized the power, the less compromises need to be made. And architectural directions are clear. Also no idea who this is. Uh, democracy obviously is not something uh, we want to give up, but it does create chaos. I like that. I've just learned that the work of Frank Gehry uh, is not chaos. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, but even, yeah, but even if it isn't, uh, I mean to ignorant individuals like myself, it appears that way. It means a guy, anyway, uh, it's neither here nor there. It means a guy next door can do what he wants and it creates a collision of thinking in cities. It means people build whatever they want. 
I would hope so. Uh, and uh, Bernard Schumann, some of the most amazing places were built because of dictators. Architecture is always related to power and related to large interests, whether financial or political. Um, I think, uh, sorry, and then the, this one is priceless. Uh, I, I think the best thing is to have a benevolent dictator who has taste. <laughs> and apparently that is our last remnant of power, that we can decide who has taste. Uh, well, so we spoke about stars and we spoke about heroes, but I mean, I think this in, in a way says, says a lot. And of course, if you go back to the Fukuyama quote, it's clear that some sort of global consensus is emerging, but it's not Western liberal uh, democracy. And it may well be that you know, in our uh, honoring of efficiency, our honoring of any system that simply allows us uh, to build in a relatively clear uh, and convenient way, you contribute uh, to a situation where that is the blanket political condition that emerges everywhere. And the question if that is still uh, a yes, and 20 minutes have elapsed. <laughs>